s sort of look at what we went through. So if we have a good knowledge of the actuator dynamics, and if we have a good knowledge of the kind of things that are good and bad for our system. In other words, you can define what is, uh, what is the right cost for our plant, then some of the methods that we talked about here are useful. Now, let's consider the scenario when you do not have the knowledge of the cost that we are optimizing. Okay? So, then, how do we work with things? Um, oh, wrong direction. Okay, so that's when we want to ask the question, what is the roots to impedance behavior imitation? Because we do not have the right set of costs to, to optimize, to plug into your system. Okay, so, so the, the, the problem or the, the, the issue with, uh, with imitation learning or mimicking impedance um, profiles um, or behaviors is that we've, we work with many heterogeneous systems, okay? So we've got, uh, we've got many, many different designs. In, indeed, many of them are not here, but we can think of transferring, say, human arm impedance behavior tasks um, to either an idealistic model and through that to some of these plants. Um, some of them are actively stiffness controlled, some of them are passive designs. So the, the idea is that, is there a nice framework for transferring impedance behaviors onto heterogeneous plants and systems? Okay, so, so broadly looking through things, um, we've got three routes to behavior transfer. Um, we can think about taking human behavior and directly transferring the policy. So here, the little notation E here stands for the expert and L here stands for the learner and X stands for the state of the system and U stands for the command. So you can, you can either directly transfer this policy um, at the, le the level of you know, what we call direct policy transfer. Um, examples of where that can be successful um, is, um, for example, if you've got a close correspondence between the human and the robot. For example, if you've got McGibbon muscles, then with little or no processing, well, everybody who worked with, with the shadow hand knows that's not quite true, but um, we can be ide idealists and say, yes, that is true. So there is, there is a... Um, a reasonable correspondence between the actuation, the, the sort of trajectories in state and controls to the corresponding um, state and action commands on, on your robot. Okay, so if you don't have that sort of correspondence, then the other way of doing, dealing with it is through a feature-based system. So you, you capture few essential features of this expert behavior, again, assuming you know the you know a model of this plant, of the human, and you know a model of the robot, okay? And then transfer it. So, oops. Examples of that can be sort of, you know, transferring um, features at the, uh, so doing, essentially computing correspondences between features and transferring that at the level of features. For example, talk profiles. So, what I'm going to show you next is, is a set of, ways of doing that transfer, assuming you've got interesting um, sort of correspondences, um, feature correspondences. Okay, so um, to understand that, we will take an example. In the, in the rest of the talk, we'll have sort of roughly maybe three plants that we're going to work with and look at how transfers can happen between them. So you think of an ideal variable stiffness actuator where the command can individually control the equilibrium position and the stiffness, um, if they're directly controllable. So, some plant, an ideal idealistic plant. Or you can have uh, the plant that you saw in the video uh, where you have a biomorphic design, but the stiffness and the positions are heavily coupled. So, the stiffness and equilibrium positions are extremely heavily coupled. Okay? Uh, or you can have the Makepa design, which is uh, designed such, in such a way that the stiffness and the equilibrium positions are nearly decoupled. So uh, almost uh, it's for the ease of control. Yeah? Um, so if you look, if you write down, again, don't want to go refer, look into the details, but if you write down the equations of motion, um, especially if you write down the torques, then you can roughly write down the torques as a, as a 
multiplication of the stiffness and some equilibrium position. Um, and depending on the design, you've got very specific uh, equations for that. OK, sure. But the one thing for these, specifically for these three designs, the one thing to note here is that you've got an interesting relationship, a generic relationship of this form. Um, some of the, it may be more complicated than the others, but you've got a generic formulation of this form. So now, if we were to do feature-based transfer or feature-based tracking of stiffness, um, one way of doing it, um, which, we, which works quite well in our case, um, is by saying that you can, you can compute irrespective of the plants that we considered, you can compute the joint stiffness by the basic definition of the stiffness. You can compute the equilibrium positions, and you can then transfer these features. So how do we transfer these features? Um, we can, for all these plants, we can compute uh, the equilibrium position and the stiffness that needs to be tracked based on the analytical equation. Then you can take the derivatives of of these individual you know, equilibrium positions and stiffness, and then constrain the changes in your commands. Constrain the, constrain the changes in your commands, or you, in this way. Now, this is a bit overloaded notation here. Uh, R here is our task space, which can be either the um, uh, equilibrium position, the stiffness, or both, depending on what you want to put as your task space. Um, J here is your appropriate Jacobian, again, depending on what you're controlling. What is your primary, what is your secondary? So yesterday, again, there was, a, there was some reference to, you know, here's your primary task and here's a secondary task and how do you sort of additionally, you know, um, handle the hierarchies. So this is flexible in the scenario, but you can do that. And then A is an arbitrary redundancy term. So this is a framework for, for transferring sort of behaviors at the level of feature tracking. Now, now, does this work? So, 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 so here's a little experiment which shows nicely, illustrates how this works. Um, so before running the video, um, well, let me run the first video. You've seen this video. This one here is just the direct transfer of the EMG signals to the muscles of the Wandoff actuator through some signal processing. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between this. So this is great if we can do a direct feature-based transfer. Okay. Um, let me just... Uh, let this run through. So, and what we'll notice is we want to look at the command signals and the, 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 the actual uh, impedance profiles and how they're transferred. And um, what we want to note here, OK, so here. So that's the EMG signal. So this is some low stiffness left and right movement. This is the co-contraction. And this is the high stiffness left and right movement. OK? And you can see here clearly that the EMG signals, uh, you've got low co-contraction. Both of them activate, and both of them activate left and right. So this is a nice pattern. Um, but now, if you look at, um, from this, if we extract using the methodology that we talked about earlier, if we extract the equilibrium positions and the stiffness profiles, then we can get something like this. And then using, the again, the methodology we just talked about, we transfer it onto, for example, a Makepa, which is a different design. Then let me play the video. Again, we can do the same thing. So from, a, from an external point of view, it doesn't look very different. So it does the same thing. When you co-contract, it co-contract, but, but the key thing to note is that the different motors are moving. So when you co-contract, this motor moves. When you change equilibrium position, this motor moves. So, so the, the, the nice thing is the behavior stays the same, but if you look at the actual profile of the commands, they're very different from what goes into this profile. So here you, for example, here, if you look at the co-contraction, both of them have to be active. Here only the co-contraction, the, the pretension motor is active. So, so this is um, a good illustration of the fact that if you use the right framework, then you can sort of take out the specifics of the, um, of the dynamics of the plant um, and track stiffness and equilibrium position irrespective of the plant, if that is what you want. So I'm not saying that is the right thing to do. But if that's what you want, then this, there's a framework for doing that. OK, so I, the reason why I said if that is the right thing is because we believe that, in general, there is a better way of doing it, uh, which is by transferring behavior at the level of cost functions or optimization uh, functions. So 
essentially extract what is being optimized um, and then transfer the behavior at that level rather than doing tracking. Okay, so, so I will be relatively quick through this section because I want to leave some time for questions. Um, but essentially, what this route tells you is if you have an expert human behavior, some recorded movements, um, and again, you assume that you have the, the cost, sorry, the, the model of the, of the expert, the trajectory and the commands, um, what you really want to extract is this cost or reward function, which can then be fed into the optimal feedback controller. And the bottom part of this is what you already saw um, in the first part of my talk. So if you know the cost function, if you know the plant model, you can got mechanisms to optimize for, for, for the stiffness and position profiles. OK, so these are details. Um, and um, again, for completeness, I want to go through this, but you can follow this talk without understanding completely the details of this. Um, so again, this is a machine learning approach uh, for doing what is called uh, apprenticeship learning. Um, so the, the typical framework is inverse optimal control. We are given the experts um, plant dynamics, you're given the trajectories in terms of the states and the commands that the expert is, is sending out, um, and then you have some key assumptions about the cost. So the cost is not freeform. So, okay, uh, I must sort of, um, we can do freeform costs, but it is less easy to do it. So for the moment, uh, we work with the parametric form of the cost function, where we assume that the, the possible parametric uh, the, the basis functions are known. So this is not a hard assumption because um, one can throw in all sorts of possible features that may be interesting in the cost function. And the algorithm is going to decide on the weight. So these weights are going to be uh, decided on its own. But you need to have the right set of basis functions. So if you, for example, if you care about end effector accuracy, if you care about energetics, if you care about you know, potential energy, if you care about others, you just throw all those terms in there. So as long as it is represented in there, um, that's fine. Um, and then you solve a forward optimization problem under the current estimate of the weights, and then you update the weights by comparing value functions. So I want to make a, a small note uh, and relate it to what uh, Jerry mentioned yesterday. So Jerry mentioned about gains uh, with the muscles and said, oh, yeah, uh, we have um, these uh, muscle gains which don't seem to affect the actual output positions um, much, even if you change the gains, so you get different solutions. So our interpretation of that different solutions is that actually that is a manifold um, of these weight vectors which will give you the same behavior. So from a point of view of apprenticeship learning, this is a manifold. So there are cases where you can get a, not just a unique solution, but a, a manifold of, um, of, of solutions uh, which are equally good from a behavioral point of view. And that's not a bad thing to have. Um, OK. So uh, let me see. Where am I? OK, so if you do that, I, I just want to run you through some quick examples. Um, so if you, we did some examples of transferring behaviors across different impedance actuators. Um, for example, this, the, the sort of Edinburgh um, uh, antagonistic, agonist antagonistic one off to uh, idealistic scenario. And the only thing you need to note here is that we get very similar patterns. So this is for um, ball hitting. And the, for different, you get very similar stiffness, torque, and velocity profiles, but you get significantly different um, motor actuations depending on the plant that you have. So, so the, this is a validation that this apprenticeship learning framework works. Um, then we have the whole reason for doing this is because we want to work with human data. And then we did the same framework. We had a, in this case, we had a, a simplified model of the wrist, the human wrist model. This is the sort of um, um, uh, the simplification of the Kawato model with the, with the full muscle dynamics. Uh, and then we had a cost function uh, with, with parameters uh, of the cost function, the basis functions like that. Again, end effector um, errors zero velocity at the end, and some energetics. Um, then uh, the details are not important, but I think um, what we found was that with direct imitation, we get lower velocities at the time of impact, whereas with apprenticeship learning, the movement is optimized to the robot dynamics. And we have a little video um, of 
um, this is Matt's work, uh, and um, uh, so again, this is using EMGs to measure um, positions, and you've got some uh, real-time EMGs um, and demonstrations of, of ball hitting, and we have a, a rough model. Um, then we extract the cost function that is being used, and then we put it on, and the direct imitation um, to this model, and you see that it does the job, it hits, but actually it hits with a lower velocity. But if we optimize for, through the apprenticeship learning framework, actually the performance improves. Um, so there, there are scenarios where uh, it, the task doesn't succeed. Um, so, um, but this is an example of, of apprenticeship learning without um, explicitly matching features. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about before I wrap up is that, in general, uh, whenever we talk about transferring from humans to robots or vice versa, uh, something's very hard. So, as you must have noticed uh, from lots of talks on human impedance, it's a complicated system. It's not easy to, to model. Um, it's, it's, um, you know, uh, it's hard to get access to system. So, the Traditionally, the model transfer of human behavior has relied on the fact that we know the demonstrator dynamics. Um, but in most practical settings, the, the complex nonlinear dynamics of the human musculoskeletal system uh, is, is hard to capture. And same, similarly, there's inconsistencies between modeling assumptions and the configuration and placement of measurement apparatus. So a good example is if you assume that you are measuring, you know, uh, EMG signal from one muscle, and then the next day you come back and you sort of do the same experiment and um, there's a slight mismatch in where you put your muscles, uh, sorry, your, your signals, then that's, um, that can lead to a problem. So we said, okay, so is there a way to take out the, the model dynamics of the imitator? Can we do model free, a, sorry, not the imitator, of, of the expert? Can we do model free um, versions? And again, um, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but all I'm going to say here is that this loop here is now with this apprenticeship learning framework where we extracted the cost function. So this bit here, we replace with the model-free version of the apprenticeship learning. So those of you who are in machine learning will, under will understand that the apprenticeship learning, uh, reinforcement learning has this sort of two camps, the model-based and the model-free. And so, so, so essentially, the difference is, is nicely illustrated here. So in the original model-based method, you have some model of the expert's human's dynamics, which is this, is this little EF here. Then we use Monte Carlo methods to estimate the value functions, the update the weights, um, then optimize the policy uh, based on that method. And that is the apprenticeship learning bit which goes in here. Now, what we want to do is, is ignore or remove the need for this model-based uh, human dynamics um, and use sort of model-free methods, um, specifically LSTDF and LSPIF. So these are, these are finite horizon versions of least squared temporal difference learning. So sorry for those of you who this doesn't make sense, but these are, these are reinforcement learning paradigms, so least squares temporal difference and least squares policy iteration, uh, but finite horizon versions of it. So there isn't a finite horizon version of that, surprisingly. So we had to come up with this interesting version. Um, and yeah, so these are the details. Uh, again, um, it's too much at this time of the day. Um, but the, the fundamental idea is you replace model-based with uh, model-free. Of course, there's a trade-off. You need, you need more data um, uh, compared to model-free. Uh, sorry, compared to model-based. Um, but um, there is a way to do it. Uh, and yeah, that's a finite horizon version of it. And then we basically did the same experiment uh, of the hitting. Now we didn't use the human arm model. So we, we, we didn't use the human arm model. Um, and we basically, uh, again, you can read the papers and publications that come out of a group. But essentially, the, the bottom idea, oh, Again, I mentioned the positioning of the EMG signals. So what we did here is, we, instead of two, two EMG signals uh, or sensors, we put three EMG sensors, so redundant set of EMG sensors. And then we let the system basically evolve and decide for itself 
what are the right features and we basically looked at the combination of u1 u2 u1 u2 and u2 and u3 and all all three mgs and did the apprenticeship learning framework completely blind of the robot of the, of the human arm model um, and we basically find that u1 and u3 is not the right combination to use so you hit at the wrong time. These two are give equally good results, so they hit at the right time. All three EMGs give you an additional redundancy which actually reflects in the small variance in the actual policies that are generated. So actually having larger number of redundant EMGs um, is a good thing if you can have an automated me mechanism for, for dealing with it. Okay, so to conclude. So, um, Optimization methods need to exploit plant actuator dynamics. And I think this is um, uh, so, so the key difference between sort of methods which plan trajectories and then use inverse dynamics to implement them. Uh, believe me, this is, it's a very good method. I've been doing that for, 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 for ages. Um, so my PhD thesis was essentially learning dynamics and implementing trajectory trajectory-based planners. Um, but when it comes to exploiting natural dynamics and exploiting um, the benefits of things like variable impedance, uh, then um, you need to be able to plan closely uh, in, in sync with the actual dynamics of the plant. So for example, if you have a, a particular plant which is able to you know, vary um, stiffness uh, and throw or hit, uh, if we plan independently of the plan dynamics, then it's, uh, it's unclear whether we'll be actually able to, to exploit the, uh, the fact that you can store energy, you can exploit gravity, things like that. Um, so direct policy methods allow you to do that. Um, they are effective, optimization methods are effective when one has a good estimate of the cost functions that need to be optimized. So if you know roughly what you want to do and what is good and bad, that's a good approach to do. Um, and when you have not a very good estimate of the plant dynamics um, or when you have no idea of the cost function that's being optimized, then imitation transfer methods are the way to go, uh, possibly the way to go. Uh, and indeed, the key message here is that one should not naively mimic impedance profiles across heterogeneous systems. So you should not say, uh, when human walking, when humans walk, we walk with a certain pattern of, um, of impedance modulation, maybe we should just mimic that on any uh, robotic systems, it makes sense when the system probably matches the biomimetics much more closely, but you know you don't have to guess. So you can use this framework for, for figuring out whether that's the right thing to do or not. Um, and potentially at the expense of large um, number of, um, or, or larger complexity of the learning larger data, a number of data points, larger capacity, at the expense of that, transfer the level of objectives is probably most appropriate. Okay, so I want to finish with that and, and just point you to two other pieces of work that I'm not going to talk about, um, but I'm putting this up because um, people who are working on that here are here. Um, so one of the things that we're working on at Edinburgh is um, a variable impedance biped, uh, which has the ability to vary uh, positions, uh, veloc positions um, stiffness and damping at the three joints. Um, and this is very much in the infancy, so we're working on this. Um, the other stuff is uh, this work uh, in collaboration with Imperial on sort of sensory versus motor noise, um, again, using the same framework of optimal feedback control. Um, so this is um, asking the question of does visual perturbation provoke impedance control? Uh, in other words, if, you, if you're not perturbed by a motor but just with a vision, um, visual error, do you get similar? Because optimal feedback control seems to, um, at least our preliminary investigation seems to suggest that one shouldn't be able to distinguish between sensory noise and motor noise. Um, so I want to end there. Uh, and um, these are the people who've done the work and the credits to them. So um, all the people with pictures here are here. So, so Matt has been working on um, the apprentice learning, pretty much the second half of the, my talk, he's been working on that. Um, David's been working on the throwing um, uh, and um, 
David's also going to be working, or is going to work with the DLR, variable impedance arm. So Jun's been primarily working on the, on the optimization of the rhythmic movements and the periodic movement walk. So Conrad, Takeshi, and George are people who have contributed to different parts of the work. And Evelina uh, is the person who's working um, on the, um, the sensory noise um, experiment. And, and Alex, um, or Sandy, is the person who's working on the biped. So um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave later in the afternoon today, possibly after dinner, but these guys are going to be around till, the af till Friday, so feel free to um, you know, get a hold of them and ask them lots of difficult, hard questions. And uh, thank you. Thanks, Hetu. Uh, a question to you about the signal-dependent noise result that you showed. Okay. I, I guess David Franklin, if he's still in the audience, if he's still not, if he's not yet left, he, he so he published a paper recently looking at arm movements and and uh, whether uh, is, is that on by the way? Is the uh, mic on? Does everybody hear that? Okay. No, I think it's not on. I don't even know where the switch for this thing is. Do you want to you want to take that? Oh, it is on? Yeah, okay. Okay. So th the, the result was the following. They looked at whether signal-dependent noise destabilizes, and the, there's two quantities. One is Im muscle impedance increases as a function of activation. Uh, standard deviation increases as a function of activation. If the impedance increase, or in fact stiffness increase, is greater than the noise increase in some metric, so you need one more scale in there to balance these out, but then you're, you're okay, meaning when you stiffen your muscle, you reduce the effective noise in your system, mm -hmm. right? But but the way you you discovered that higher Im, higher impedance stabilizes is by introducing a, some sort of a covariance between the two muscles, which is why like covariating them. Re it's not covariance, but uh, what I've done is I've directly modeled the effect of the co-contraction on the plant. So I've not gone through the detailed model of what the, plant, what the muscle does. But uh, what I've said is when it co-contracts, potentially what happens is it is a, it is a stabilizing effect on the, not, not, not on the variability of the muscle actuation, but on the end effector movement um, um, of, the, of the plant. So the plant becomes stiffer and, and, and it's is less prone to uh, to um, perturbations. So you pick you, the graph you showed had U1, U2, and this color-coded thing yep. showed uh, showed like standard deviation. Yes. And the U1 and U2, I, I understood were muscle activation. Yes. Uh, right. Yes. So as you increase muscle activation, you, you but what's, what's plotted here in there is the is the in, end point. The end the point is a plant dynamics. Yes. So it's not it's not what the the muscles do. It's what ha what is the reaction of the plant to noise. So what is the effect of noise on the plant? I see. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So um, a little bit of philosophical question maybe. Sure. So if the world is divided on one side where people want to make dynamical models of you know, muscles and then skeleton and so on and so forth, uh -huh. and if we want to have say machine learning based techniques on one side. <laughs> right. So um, how do we have a compromise, or where do we stand? Do we, because say for example, in here, one of the key features of why you were able to go from human EMG to uh, a mechanical system that follows it, is that in both cases, as the actuation increase, the stiffness increase for the actuators. Otherwise, this won't work, right? If you have linear springs, you increase the actuation, you won't get added stiffness at the joint. You have to have that behavior, which is muscle-like, and I'm wondering whether that would come out of, you know, we are not learning that, or well, is that model okay, coming so, out so of I think, I think the actual actuator mechanism of how we realize the stiffness or the damping is, is slightly a different issue. I mean, you, you think, okay, so, so the, with, the, with this sort of bi co actuated um, muscle thing, the reason why we can get um, stiffness with linear springs is because you have a little axis off right, uh, exactly. which pushes. The but, moment but, arms. Yeah, really. the moment arm. But, but I mean, I, I, uh, so my philosophy is that I really don't 
care about what the mechanism is, as long as we get the right, um, somebody yesterday, was it Alin, yeah, who, who put up this, this nice um, spec sheet of what we require in terms of you know, uh, impedance ranges, um, the, how, fa how fast we can change impedances, um, what is the damping characteristics, that is, that is the essence. Because if you want to mimic the things and you need to have a system which is capable of at least generating the same range of, of things, right, right. irrespective of what the mechanism is. There are lots of considerations so, so. like energy and you know, how right, compact right. it is and all that kind of stuff. Right. So I think my question is, as a designer, I need to know those essential features. Sure. And I, you know, but the machine learning techniques may not give me that if I'm trying to learn the dynamics. You're right, absolutely. So I think that's where uh, yeah, so, so, so potentially your question's coming from, so, so if you're modeling human behavior and human impedance, then where would that information feed into this system? And I think one of the places where it feeds into is potentially designing the right range of, of stiffness and, and damping and, and various measurements. The other, indeed, there's the whole big area, maybe half of the people work here, is understanding how human motor control works. And that's, I mean, we can use the same, we can use some tools from optimization and machine learning to understand that, uh, but that's, that's an end in itself, I think. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay.